Hi, I'm Ryan Savansky, curator for Battleship New Jersey News and Memorial. Today, as part of our nuclear fortnight series, uh, where we remember the 75th anniversary of the only time that nuclear warheads were used in combat, uh, we are talking about the Iowa class battleships and their nuclear capability. Now, most people know that. Uh, the Iowa's in the 1980s and 90s were able to carry nuclear tomahawk cruise missiles. But that wasn't the first time they were nuclear armed. Beginning in the mid 1950s, New Jersey, Iowa, and Wisconsin were all armed with uh, what is known as Project Katie. Now, Katie was an army. 11 inch projectile um, that was a nuclear artillery shell, basically. After World War II, the Army, the Navy, the brand new Air Force um, were all fighting over funding, and it seemed like future wars were going to be decided uh, by nuclear warheads, not by conventional means. So each service branch attempted to develop its own nuclear capabilities. And uh, the Navy pursued two options, carrier-launched aircraft that could drop nuclear bombs strategically, uh, and that option failed uh, initially, and nuclear artillery that could be used tactically. Uh, and they already had some of the largest artillery ever developed, and they turned that artillery into the largest uh, nuclear cannon ever built. So Battleship New Jersey's 16-inch guns are one of the largest nuclear cannons ever deployed. Now, earlier I said that only New Jersey, Iowa, and Wisconsin got this modification. Missouri never got it because she was already in the process of being beaten mission uh, following the Korean War. She was the only one that had remained in service following World War II uh, for any significant length of time, and so she was the first one decommissioned. Within half a decade, the other islands would join them, but they still remained nuclear assets for the country uh, that could be reactivated with uh, a period of notice. So, there isn't a whole heck of a lot of information out there on Project Katie. Um, and a lot of what's out there is maybe not 100% uh, accurate. So, take that with a grain of salt when you listen to all the things I have to say in this video. I get asked all the time if uh, I work with other museum ship curators, and the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Uh, some of them I talk to on an almost daily basis. Uh, Megan on Missouri, I'm sorry. Uh, other ones I bother pretty frequently. Uh, my counterpart Keith in Wisconsin and my counterpart David in Iowa, uh, we talk very frequently. Uh, share research, ask each other questions, uh, ask each other to take pictures of different places on the ships because uh, it was removed on ours or maybe never happened on ours. So um, even though these four ships were built nominally identical, they are extremely different. Uh, and, and so we find ourselves talking all the time. And for this video, I reached out to all four islands to ask them what they knew uh, and they all got back to me very quickly uh, and went on expeditions in deep, dark places of their own ships, um, like this space that we're in now on New Jersey. So, um, Project Katie, it is known that uh, turret number two's lower projectile flat was modified to hold 10 nuclear shells. That is pretty well known. Battleship New Jersey is very fortunate that we have about a do 
those in blueprints relating to Project Katy from three distinct time periods. Uh, and those blueprints indicate that work was done in this space where I'm standing right now. This is uh, or was known as Magazine 4, we're down on 4th uh, 19, space 19, uh, M, M for Magazine. So if you pull out your World War II, Korean, or uh, Vietnam era booklet of general plans and look up magazine A419F. That's the room we're in right now. It's one that we've never filmed in before. I believe that based on these blueprints, this space uh, was converted to holding nuclear warheads uh, associated with Project A. So, first a disclaimer. A blueprint is just a plan. The fact that it shows up on a blueprint does not mean that it was actually done in practice. Uh, there are some marks on the bulkheads in here, which I'll show you in a second, that indicate that something was done in this magazine that was not done in any of the other magazines on the ship. Uh, 20 some of my magazines, and this is the only one that got these particular brackets. So, that leads me to believe that this is Project Katie related. Um, again, take it with a grain of salt. I've got no hard documentation, no picture of this space, no uh, true recollections that say that they work on nuclear warheads in here. Now, we all know that Tile class battleships carry and projectiles for Project Katie, but the warhead and the projectile uh, were not stored or assembled. Like many nuclear weapons, they had to be assembled prior to use. So the warheads had to be locked up somewhere in a magazine space. I believe this is that place. Um, it is deep inside the armored citadel of the space. And uh, when they modified turret two, she lost a lot of her shell storage capability. And so she didn't need the powder for those shells. Uh, and when you map out how many shells she lost, uh, losing about a quarter of the, the lower shell flat, it comes out to about uh, 50 or so shots, which is roughly how much powder this space would hold. So I believe that these racks here, which were designed to hold the aluminum powder canisters, uh, they're all bolted down to the deck. So it's relatively simple to unbolt these and remove them, and now this is no longer a magazine. This hoist is basically the only thing in here that isn't uh, bolted down, it's, it's welded down. Perhaps it was just closed up and left unused, makes a good uh, tabletop, or perhaps this gravity hoist was used to transport the warhead into the lower magazine below us, where it can be easily taken into the turret and back up to be loaded in the shell. Now, um, there is only two places to enter the turret from, and neither of them will on fourth deck. There's, there's one below us on fifth deck, and there's one up on the main deck. I don't think we're taking the warhead up to the main deck and through the gun turret into a gun pit. Uh, down to the lower projectile flat. I believe that they're lowering it from here, either through a hatch outside or through this gravity voice, and then taking it in the bottom of the turret uh, and up a level to the uh, lower projectile flat. That's not all we have in here. If you look at these I beams, something was bolted to that, something substantial that was welded into the bulkhead. Now, these three foot tall or so I beams do not show up in any other magazine. And they've got mount mounting brackets of some sort overhead. Whatever was bolted onto this was also locked back into that. So perhaps it was a tall safe uh, or, or some sort of shelving unit. I'm not entirely sure but it was substantial and I didn't want it to move. 
Now going over to this bullet head, you see we've got a series of other mounting points, which again, could be shelving related or could be something else. Down here on the deck, we've got a series of uh, parallel line tack marks where something was welded here. And again, this isn't something that we see on the deck in other spaces, like there was some other sort of ammo handling in that space at one time. It only shows up here in 419. And this goes the whole length of the ball pit, it's a long side of the room. Uh, there's also metal plates here in the insulation that were added uh, that show that something was mounted here and cut off that again does not show up anywhere else. This box, maybe it's for a sound powered phone, I'm not sure there isn't a phone jack over here, um, but if we were actually storing powder in this space, it's completely inaccessible. So here is the powder rack and we would be an aluminum canister stacked up and there isn't a way to get past those canisters around the back to this box. So when this box was installed here, and we do not see elsewhere, they weren't storing powder here. What could they have been storing? Uh, and finally, so this means that on all four walls of this space, we have modifications uh, that don't show up in other places. We have these mounting brackets for shelves that are identical to mounting brackets that we're going to see in the lower projectile flat. And that's where we're headed next. So now we are on the lower projectile flat for turret two. This is the space that most sources quote as where the uh, shelves were stored and where all of the shelving and everything took place. Uh, talking to my counterparts at the other battleship museums, uh, they had heard different stories from all the histories they've done and things that they had seen on their ship. Which leads me to believe that not all of the Iowas received the same modifications. Uh, in fact, our blueprints are marked with three separate dates. Uh, the earliest blueprints, which mostly just talk about modifications here uh, in Turret 2, date back to the fall of 1954. Summerall, in his uh, book, Iron Class Battleships, which is one of my Bibles I keep on my desk, uh, he specifically says that New Jersey re uh, received the modification first in 1954. Now, this predates the final development of the uh, Mark 13, or excuse me, Mark 23 nuclear projectile. Uh, but it happens in the time period when the projectile was being developed, which started about a year earlier. So it makes sense that they would make the modifications uh, as the shell uh, was being developed. A second set of blueprints are from uh, mid-1955 period, and those include uh, conversions to the magazines and um, they also include modifications to turret one and three, uh, their projectile flats, so that they could uh, fire the shells as well. Uh, specifically so they could assemble the warhead. So you've got the shell, which they more or less took a Mark 13 uh, high capacity round. Uh, and then you've got the warhead, now you've, which on the blueprints shows up as just a letter Z in quotations, Z stowage. Uh, so I believe that indicates the warhead. You have the squab, You have the swam, which is the detonator for the warhead, and then you've got the windshield or nose cone, which goes over top of it. Uh, so what most people believe is that the Mark 13 high capacity shell, they removed the bursting charge from inside and they used the existing shell casing to house the warhead. And then you screw on the windscreen and voila, you've got an armed shell. You don't keep an armed shell laying around. 
when you're going to shoot it, you use it. Uh, and we'll come back to why those 1955 blueprints are interesting in a second. But there's a third set from uh, early 1956, which is specifically additional lighting and alarm systems for places where the uh, shells are stored. So uh, I don't know that the three Iowas that got this conversion all got the same conversion or had it happen in the same place. Or like I said earlier, a plan is just a plan. Just because it shows up on the blueprint doesn't mean that's what was actually done. Uh, oftentimes what the yard workers are able to interpret from the blueprint or how they're able to make it work is not exactly what shows up on the blueprint. Uh, oftentimes ships don't go in for yard periods uh, at the same time. So like New Jersey goes in first, she maybe just gets a first round of modifications. Iowa, Wisconsin go in later, they might get more done. Uh, maybe as they go in for later yard, yard periods, they get the lighting and uh, alarm system installed. I see no evidence of any of those systems here on New Jersey. There should still be weld marks or lighting fixtures, uh, wire runs, something. Uh, I, I really don't see those, so I don't know that they were, uh, that that modification ever happened here. Now, um, let's talk about what we do see here that might be Project Katie related. So, we are roughly 90 degrees to the starboard side uh, in turret two. So up there it's forward and behind where you're standing is uh, the shell hoists at the aft end of the projectile flag. So something like a quarter to a third of this part of the uh, shell deck here, they would have These fittings where the shells were held and that would have allowed them to put in workbenches, shelving, other things. Uh, and if you look at these brackets here, I believe these are the remnants of the shelving that was added uh, for assembly of the warhead here in the magazine. Here are some pictures of the same assembly in the same area on Wisconsin. Uh, I believe that is what this would have looked like when fully used. It seems like their G2 division continued to use those shelves for things after uh, Project Katie was removed. On here, clearly, they decided they didn't need it and stripped it out, perhaps during the Vietnam Commission. So, the ship was designed to carry 10 warheads uh, and the shells to fire them, nine practice shells, and one drill shell. Uh, so the drill shell is obvious. That one is not designed to be fired. It does not have a brass base ring on the bottom. Uh, I believe that is just to practice assembly uh, of the warhead. Uh, so that's something that they could trail on, uh, if you will. The nine Practice shells, they are the same size, um, weight of one of the nuclear projectiles. Uh, they just don't have a warhead in it. So you can fire them out of the guns uh, and, and see how the shell performs. The fact that there are nine of those uh, and that we carry, or we're supposed to carry, ten uh, of the actual projectiles is very telling. Iowa-class battleships have nine barrels. In the blueprints uh, from 1955 that say each of the turrets is going to be modified to assemble the warhead, uh, and they're all going to be modified on the starboard side, uh, even turret three, which facing in the opposite direction. So in theory, if you interpret the blueprints, hers would be on the port side, the forward two would be on the starboard side. There's a specific note in there that says to make all the modifications on the starboard side. Hmm. What that tells me, 
along with the number of shells, is that the warheads were going to be assembled here, three of them in each gun turret. The gun turret would rotate to face the port side so that the hoists were all facing the starboard side right here so that the shells could be taken from right here to the hoist and you could fire nine of them at once, a full salvo. The Mark 23 has a 20 kiloton warhead in it. Um, it's about the size of the one that destroyed Hiroshima, I believe. They're a tactical weapon, they're not a strategic weapon. Uh, it's not like a deterrence system. It's we're in a shooting war and we want to eliminate that city because it is a, a uh, resource that the enemy has. Um, I believe that all the shells were stored here in turret two. When the order was given to destroy the city, the idea was that the shells uh, and the warheads would be moved so that you had three in each turret. And there's a tenth one in case you have some point of failure with one of the other nine. Um, and then they can all be loaded from one side and fired from one side in a broadside um, that would destroy that city and everything else around it nine times over. These are a one-time use thing. We're going to talk a little bit later about the survivability of battleships when it comes to nuclear weapons. Um, this was tested and trained on but uh, remember, our guns have a range of about 23 miles. Uh, a 20 kiloton warhead is going to spray radiation a lot further than that. Um, you weren't necessarily going to get a second shot. So the only reason you're carrying more than one warhead is so that you can fire them all in a first strike. You fire them all at one time. 50 of these projectiles were built that uh, tend to be deployed on each of the three battleships that were modified, tend to be deployed on the fourth Iowa class battleship Missouri, which could be modified uh, in the time it took to reactivate all these other ships. Uh, and then another 10 shells in the arsenal that can reload if one is uh, used. Uh, they could theoretically be used with some of the 16-inch coastal artillery that was still out there. They could have been used if Illinois was completed, uh, but more likely they're to resupply some of these ships if they fired them. Um, only one time was a training round fired. Uh, Wisconsin allegedly fired one in 1957 as a test proof of concept. Uh, which makes sense. She was the last of the Iowa's decommissioned in the 1950s. By 1957, uh, when these projectiles had actually finished development and were going out to the fleet, uh, New Jersey and Iowa were already starting their decommissioning process, and uh, Missouri was already in the reserve fleet. Summerall, in his book, says that uh, while New Jersey was modified first, she never actually carried any of the shells, uh, maybe the drill round, but never any of the live or training rounds. Uh, and he does say that Iowa and Wisconsin did. I'm not sure what his sources were or his interviews on that, but uh, that's what it says. So these shells were in the inventory from October of 56, almost two years after New Jersey was modified, uh, up until 1962. Uh, in 1961, they were ordered to be removed from the inventory, so a lot of sources say that 1961, uh, but some sources say that they weren't removed until 1962. In any event, uh, the Iowas were all decommissioned by 1958, so the shells were just sitting in warehouses for the last three or four years of their existence before they were demilitarized. If you would like to see one of these shells, there is one known to still exist uh, at the National Atomic Museum in New Mexico. Here's a picture of that shell. So that's what 
I think I know about Project Katie and the use of nuclear 16 inch shells on Iowa class battleships. Uh, if you think you have more information on this, let me know in the comment section down below. I'll also drop any questions you have. Uh, myself or someone else will get back to you as quick as we can. Uh, if you would like to support the museum and our YouTube channel, uh, please check the description below for ways you can donate. If you would like to specifically support digitizing our blueprint collection so that blueprints like the ones on Project Katie uh, can be scanned for future generations and possibly even put online, let us know it's a restricted donation. When you make the donation, tell us what it's for. Uh, and as always, uh, thanks for watching. Remember to like, share, and subscribe so you get notified when we make content. And stay tuned all this week and next as we release content relating to nuclear weapons, nuclear power, uh, and nuclear strategy.